Well, good morning. We're going to continue worshiping now in the Word of God. We're in a rich section of Scripture. You'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to begin looking at verse 4 this morning. I'm going to read our current section to you, and then we'll pray, and we will open up the Word of God. Look with me in verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 2. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed." But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's pray over these words. Father, we come before you, and I have been so blessed looking at these words and studying them this week. I pray now, Lord, as we come together to worship through the preached word, I pray that your spirit would now take these words and illuminate them to our mind. God, enlighten us to their truth. Lord, let us understand uh, your heart, your intent of these words. And I pray, God, that as we do, that your spirit would apply them to our lives. And so we, we look to you to do what no man can do. We look to you to... Reveal yourself and put Jesus Christ on display, and that he would be worshiped as we hear about him even this morning. And it is in the name of Christ that we do pray. Amen. I don't know how many of you have ever ever played this game. It's you, you kind of say a word, and everyone says the first thing that comes to their mind. And so, for example, if you're playing and I said dog, you know, you'd throw out friend, protector. My dog's name is Rudy, uh, Bone, you know, just the first thing that comes to mind, you just kind of throw it out and you learn a lot about each other and it's kind of a fun game. Well, I would like to play that game with you this morning. I'm going to say a word and in your minds, don't say it out loud, uh, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear it? And I, the word is temple, temple. What, what comes to mind? For some of you, it may be a church that you grew up in. I grew up in a large Catholic church, and when I think of that, that comes to mind sometimes. It could be maybe an oriental structure, one of those great temples that come to mind, Uh, a cathedral like in London, or or possibly even Solomon's temple and all of its grandeur and all of its beauty. Well, this morning, Peter's going to teach us what should come to the mind of the believer when he hears that word. Christians are now the temple of God. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands any longer, but temples made with God's hands. The church of God is, I'm a part of that temple. That is what Peter wants you to get. He wants you to understand. He wants us to live into the fullness of the picture of us being the temple of God. And so we're going to learn about this temple and that there's going to be priests that are in it. It's going to tell us what kind of sacrifices that should be offered up. It's just as beautiful picture that Peter is now going to give us. And after spending all week in this metaphor, it's, I think it's become one of my favorite metaphors. It teaches us much about the Christian life and the church. So let's give a little thought to the type of the Old Testament 
temple. When you think of temple in the Old Testament, it, it was God's institution. The tabernacle, and, and which would become the structure for the temple, was given to Moses in Exodus. And Moses was told to build it exactly to the pattern that was given to him by God on Mount Moriah, and thus Israel did. In Hebrews, the writer tells us that the exact pattern was symbol-laden with amazing beauties, that we will learn about that temple that Peter's going to describe here in chapter 2. This Old Testament temple, it pointed to an ultimate temple. It pointed to an ultimate priest, to an ultimate sacrifice that would come for our sin. It was all picturing something more beautiful than itself. So furthermore, God's temple was to define the people of God. The Israelites, God's chosen people, you only have I loved. He, he set them apart and they were to gather at the temple on their high holy days and days of worship. It was to be the center of where God manifested his glory in the holy of holies where it was housed. Yom Kippur, the one time a year the blood would be brought in and sacrificed in that place to atone for sin, to picture it. The priests were serving as a mediator officer in the temple between God and man. But the temple was the center of the entire sacrificial worship for Israel. And they had corporate praise with David and the Psalms. They had these sophisticated songs and music and they would gather and they would worship. And so Peter presupposes that his readers know all of this. And he's going to pull out some Old Testament passages that actually had been prefiguring and pointing to what Peter is now going to tell you. This is what has come in Christ. They find their fulfillment in him. And so the beauty of what has come in Christ is so glorious, and that's what Peter is going to paint for us here in the weeks ahead. So we get to study it for a month is my goal. I pray that you would engage your minds and hearts and that you would fight to understand this, to understand it and then get it into your hearts so that we can offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. That's where this passage is leading. I want spiritual sacrifices offered up to God by his priests. I want that happening in our assembly this morning. I want a whole church of priests offering up sacrifices which are pleasing to God, not just external dead stuff. Spiritual sacrifices, that is my desire and prayer this morning. And let me give you your outline of what we're going to look at for the next month. I want to look at four elements to understand the temple of God then today. And this morning, we're going to begin looking in verses 4 through 5 at the construction of the temple. And then in verses 6 through 8, we're going to see really the foundation of this temple, and we're going to look at Old Testament passages that, that pictured it and taught it. And then in verses 9 through 10, the significance of this temple. It's beautiful what the significance is. And then in verses 11 through 12, I want you to see the holiness of of this temple that God has called us to be. So let's take up the first point, the construction of the temple. Verse 4, coming to him is to a living stone. <clears throat> God is now building a new temple. And it isn't made out of marble or stone, but he is building now, hear this, with people. We are the stones. You guys are stones. And God now is building a temple. What word comes to mind when you hear the word stone? Just like temple. What do you think of when you hear a stone? You're stones. And he's fitting us together as he's building this temple as, as, as stones all in the right place, right where he wants them. For all, for all of his elect, he is building a temple. And it's fitting together uh, with stones. And it's the fulfillment temple. We are the new covenant temple. The one that the old was pointing and that the old was picturing. This is where redemptive history has been moving and you're a part of it. Your stones in the temple of God. And so as we consider it, I want to drop this passage maybe into its context first because it's such a grand and marvelous metaphor that it could take really a life of its own. It could become its own thing and miss why is Peter painting this gorgeous picture of a temple for us this morning. So come back into the context. Chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, we've been looking at the Word of God. And when the Word of God is attended by the Spirit of God, it caused you to be born again. 
And then last week in verses 1 through 2 of chapter 2, this word can also cause you then to grow in respect to salvation. You, you thirst for this word and you will grow into the image of Jesus Christ where you love like no other and you put off those sins of self, the, the sins of being an Adam, the sins that affect relationship and hurt love. Those things are put off. And so thirst for the pure milk of the word of God that you might grow. And I see verse 3 as the hinge then to both sections. Uh, it's a first-class condition. Since you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. The, the kindness, he says, since you've tasted my kindness, thirst for the word of God. Because this word reveals God and all of his kindness to us in Christ. Thirst for it. it, it there's such a kindness. Word changes when it's no longer just stories and things that God wants you to do, and it's the revelation of God's glory in Jesus Christ and all of His kindness. Now this word takes on life. I thirst for it. I long for it. That is the the, the turning point. And now in verse four, it's it's the kindness of God. You thirst for the one who's been revealed as the kindness of God. So I thirst for His word. And I thirst for the one that this word reveals. I thirst for Christ coming to him. The kindness of God to me in Christ Jesus. I thirst for a word that reveals him. And I just thirst for him. You don't come to see Christ for salvation and say, thank you, Jesus. This is so good. I'll see you in glory. You thirst for him. You come to him. Coming to him as a living stone. You are joined to Christ as one, and you just keep coming. If I could summarize the Christian life in one thing, it's this morning. You keep coming again and again to this sweet Christ. You just keep, it's a present tense participle. You don't come one time. The believer thirsts for Christ as well, and you just keep coming to him. This is the Christian life in a nutshell. And I can tell you this, I've had seasons where I can get really dry and I can start struggling and I can get real discouraged. And I've had times where my Bible reading didn't even pull me out of it. Coming to church didn't pull me out of it. It almost made it worse. Meeting with my friends didn't pull me out of it. Praying didn't pull me out of it. I just felt stuck. But then a glimpse of Christ, and that callus is just peeled right off. Coming to him is my Christian life. There's a beauty that only Christ can heal and fix and grow and change. Coming to him. Peter, where else can I go? The one writing this, you alone have the words of life. Paul said, we proclaim him. We preach Christ and him crucified. And so I'll ask you simply, have you quit coming? Have you lost him in your busyness as we move into the, even the Christmas season, probably the most popular season to lose Christ? Have you lost him in your means of grace? You, you get up and you do your reading and you come to church and you meet with people, you do all these things and you've lost Christ right in the middle? Have we lost Christ? I, I have this old illustration I use, but a lot of you haven't heard it, so I'm going to say it again as there was this little uh, party in, in Boston. It was a christening party of a little baby that this couple had finally had after 10 years of trying for a baby. And all their friends came and they came and they put their jackets in the bedroom and they were just having the best time talking about this baby and celebrating and having fellowship and punch and everything was great. And then someone finally said, oh, by the way, where's the baby? And the mother's heart startled and she runs into the bedroom and the baby had been laying on that on that uh, bed, and it was smothered to death with all of the coats. So while we're sitting here celebrating the baby and having such a great time, we smothered him with our coats. How often is that a picture of the church? Where we come and we celebrate and we sing all of these songs while we're smothering Christ with our coats, coming to him. That is the only way to describe our lives. Blind Bartimaeus, what do you want? I want to see Jesus. I love that hymn, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, and I keep coming 
and I keep coming to Jesus again and again. Well, how, how am I to come to him? If you'll look with me in verse 4, I'm coming to him as to a living stone. This Greek word, it, it means a corner stone. Peter uses the analogy of a cornerstone in a building or a house or, or a temple as that of, of Christ and the church. And so this is probably the most important stone in the whole building if you were a builder. This thus was the most costly and the most expensive because the whole house depended on this one stone. It was literally the, the key to the rest of the whole structure. In Isaiah 28, 16, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed, and he who believes in it will not be disturbed. So I'm going to build a new temple, and the new temple, the foundation of the whole thing will be Jesus Christ. He's going to be the cornerstone. And i got a quote here. I just want to read to you a little bit about the foundation stone. Christ is the foundation of the build in the church. And according to building practices of Peter's time, when men set out to build a building, they wanted stones that fit perfectly. And the most important stone in the entire building was the cornerstone. The perfection of the cornerstone helped maintain the perfect symmetry of the rest of the building. And like a plumb line stretching in every direction, the cornerstone set the direction lines for the building both horizontally and vertically. And if any of the angles were off, the whole building would be off. If the horizontal angle was not a perfect right angle, the building would be skewed. If the vertical angle was not correct, the building would collapse outward or inward. All those angles were set by one massive cornerstone to which all the other stones were laid out in agreement. And that is a wonderful picture of how Christ relates to the church. This was the first stone laid. It was the most important stone and it was the key to the whole thing. It was the key to what that house would become because everything was based on that cornerstone. It had to be perfect. Whatever the cornerstone is, the house would become. And so Christ is the perfect cornerstone of the bride of Christ. It had to be the toughest and strongest stone. If that stone lacked integrity, it would crumble and the whole house was lost. This was literally the one stone that the whole house was resting upon. And so this is so beautiful what Peter is doing. What does this tell you about Christ? Christ. What, what a beautiful illustration of Jesus Christ. So I want to look at three things that this tells me about Christ. It teaches me this about my cornerstone. First, Jesus is our life foundation. What's the hymn that we sing? The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. All of Christianity is built upon him. The whole church, the whole building is built upon him and the apostles' teaching, which is about him. And he is what all of this temple and all of the church is built upon. His person, his life, his work, his victory. Jesus is the foundation. If you lose Christ, the whole thing crumbles. In Revelation 2, he says, if you lose your first love and don't fix it, I'm going to remove my lampstand. I'm going to take out the cornerstone. <laughs> from the church, and you're going to gather every Sunday and sing your songs and, and pretend like the word's being preached, and I won't even be there. You can build a church on something other than a cornerstone. That's terrifying. Our passage says, the one who believes then and who trusts upon him shall not be disappointed. In the Greek, it's kind of phrased, shall in no way ever be disappointed. The one who will put their hope and their trust in this cornerstone, you are never, ever going to be disappointed. Never will you be disappointed if that is your foundation. So my question is, what does it mean to trust in this cornerstone? Because this is tied into coming to him again and again. It's tied to believing in him. And so it's, it's a trusting, to, to trust, to, to put your weight on this cornerstone. 
So it means that we, we come to Christ for salvation. We come to him and we become stones in this temple. And every stone, every believer that is placed in this temple is set in, in, in place a, a, along the lines of the cornerstone. Everything in the temple is leaning upon him. I love that hymn, leaning on the everlasting arms. We are all leaning on Christ, trusting him, foundation, everything. So being a Christian, guys, has to be more than mental assent. Do not die thinking that the Christian life is just nodding your head to some truth. Demons believe and shudder. It is not enough. It is more than just taking up these teachings. I like Christian teaching. I take it up. It's more than I like Jesus' ethics of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to try to love my neighbor as myself. It's more than saying, I believe that Jesus died. Don't miss the beauty that is here this morning. And I just want you to see this. Trust means shifting the center of your gravity to him. It, it, it's to quit trusting in yourself. And it's now to lean and put everything on Jesus Christ. I heard a preacher this week talking about this. And he brought up this example when he used to work in the business world. And he said to, they, they did this little uh, kind of thing to build trust with one another. And they would all stand in a circle, and there would be one guy that had to stand in the middle, and he had to just fall back into someone's arms and trust that they would catch him. We never played this game at my house because it wasn't safe. <laughs> <clears throat> to do this, you have to shift your center of your gravity from your feet to someone else's gravity to catch you, and it's a very vulnerable thing. And, so, and here it is, is you've got to quit standing in your own gravity, your own confidence, your own righteousness, your own goodness. I have to stop leaning on me, and I'm going to put all of my gravity, I'm going to lean everything on the cornerstone, I'm going to put my hope in Jesus Christ. The gospel is coming to him. He has become your cornerstone. His foundation has to become yours. So we must trust in Jesus Christ. That's the essence of faith. I'm going to lean on Christ. It isn't just mental assent. I am going to take these truths, I believe them, and I'm going to lean on the cornerstone. You have to make him the center of your life. This is what we call lordship. You've got to put all your gravity on him. I lean on you. You are the Lord of my life. I give it to you. I shift the center of gravity to you, Christ, I'm done trusting in myself and what I can do. I'm done trying to be my own savior. I'm done trying to protect myself and get myself to glory. I am going to lean on one thing. I'm going to lean on the everlasting arms of Christ, your cornerstone. Everything rests and depends in this temple on that. The Christian rests it all on Christ and his finished work. I rest in his intercession. I rest in him holding me. I rest in him completing the work. I rest that even if I walk in the shadow of the valley of death, he'll be with me, for I fear no evil. I'm resting everything on Christ. So maybe as just a point of application, I want you to ask yourself, what is your functional cornerstone and I, some of you are saying, I knew you were going to do that, Pastor. I, was, I knew it before you even did it. It needs to be asked. What is your functional cornerstone? I'm not talking about your professed cornerstone. What is your functional cornerstone? And so the cornerstone is what sets the course for the entire building. And it sets the course then for your entire life. What is it that everything in your life is built on? And just to answer this before God with honesty, what is that cornerstone that everything in your life is being built on? I just sit and watch people now. That's what you do when you get older. And I, I love observing and just watching. And you know what I'm noticing? They're frantic. People are afraid. And the world's crumbling. And everybody's just afraid. And they are just running around frantic because of what is their functional cornerstone. 
what is it that drives their whole life? And it's, for someone, it might be success. All I want to do is, is be successful. I don't want to be a, a loser. I don't want to, remember I quoted Rocky when he's, his wife says, why do you got to fight the champ? And she, he said, I got to prove I'm not a bum. You know, and his whole life is he's trying to show he's not a bum. And I just, I got to have success to, to prove that I'm not a bum. And for some of you, that's your whole functional foundation is I just want to show that I'm not a bum. I just want accomplishment. I'm a perfectionist and my whole life, what drives the whole thing is I am a, one who's going to accomplish things. I just want possessions, and I'm going to work, and I'm going to labor as hard as I can so I can be the one with the most toys at the end, and I'm going to win. I just like possessions, and that's all I care about. That's, that's my drive. All I care about is a relationship. <laughs> all I want is to, to, I just need a spouse, and my whole life is driven, everything, the way I dress, the way I drive, the way I speak, everything is trying to get a girlfriend. I just, that's my functional cornerstone. It's retirement. Everything that I do is working for the security of retirement. And it's why I, how hard I work. It's how I treat my family. It's why I don't serve in the church. You know, everything about my life is, is retirement. Oh, Jesus is my cornerstone, but I'm frantic and I'm afraid because of my IRA and the stock market might go down because America's going to collapse. And I, I'm frantic. For others, it could be ease. All I, all, I, all I care about, my functional cornerstone is I want my life to be easy. And if God doesn't make it easy, I'm going to walk away. And it's just everything about your life is how can I make it ease. Your real cornerstone will set the course of your life. And it will dictate all that you do. It will show what everything is driving to. And so this has to be answered this morning before God. Come to him and make him your all in all your cornerstone, and lean your whole life set on him? Is there parts of my life that aren't on the cornerstone? And I, I just want a little bit of fun. I just want a little bit of this for a season. And there's just parts of my life that I, I'm not putting on the cornerstone. Every part was resting upon the cornerstone. Shift your center of gravity to Christ alone. He's your life. You keep coming to him because he is your cornerstone. My whole life is shaped and built around him. And when this happens, you know what? You'll quit being frantic that I'll lose my real cornerstone. Because this cornerstone says to me, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. You can begin to walk in peace. You will in no way ever be disappointed if you'll make this the cornerstone of your life. The fear goes away. His perfect love starts to drive out all fear coming to him. This is the remedy for everything that you're feeling with fear and being frantic and all the, all the battles. Put the, the center of gravity on Christ. Put it all on the cornerstone. So what is your functional cornerstone? You want to know how to know? When the winds hit and the storms come and the tempest howls, if it takes down your cornerstone, the whole house will fall. And the way you'll know is when you lose that one thing that is your functional cornerstone, when it's taken away, everything will collapse. And I've watched it several times. Your whole life will collapse. Take away my kid, and it's over. Take away my spouse, and I have nothing left. Take away my house, and I, I'll, I'll kill myself. And, and this is it, is what is your functional cornerstone? Will it be like Job, naked I came and naked I will depart? I was a man resting. Listen to what Jesus said. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew, the things I'm talking about, and they burst against that house and it did not fall. Why? Because it had been founded upon the rock. It had been resting on the cornerstone. And therefore, it did not fall. It did not collapse. No matter what comes against it and into it, this faith is built on Christ. I'm leaning on him. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act upon them, he'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains came. So that, that's a functional cornerstone that's not Jesus. 
and the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and they burst against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. It was a massive, eternal destruction. And so my question is, what are your non-negotiables? Is it your children, your health, your money, or your job? The things that if they're taken away, you'll be mad at God and you'll be cursing Him. I'm fighting you this morning for blessing. The one who hopes in Christ will not be disappointed. If you build your life, all of your life on this, you will not be disappointed. I, I, I've watched people with functional cornerstones that aren't Christ, and they're always disappointed. This is, this is, this is blessing. I'm going to build everything on Christ. The one who trusts and rests upon him and makes him his cornerstone will never wish that he made something else his cornerstone. It's the only house that will not fall in the judgment of God that's coming to a theater near you. This is the only thing that will stand when that judgment comes. I pray that you would see this. The flood is not your problem. Most of you are afraid of the flood. The problem is what is your cornerstone? I want you to be focused on that. What is your cornerstone? Do you see the beauty of this? Becoming a Christian is not just a change of mind. I used to believe in evolution, but now I believe in creation. It's tearing up all the stones of your old life, dying to your old cornerstone, saying something like, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's, I died to Paul. I live to this cornerstone. The life I live, I live in light of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Everything on Paul was resting on the cornerstone. Dying to it, living to Jesus, trusting him. Everything based on the cornerstone, the resurrected, victorious Christ coming again is the only thing that can explain your life. What else? That's one. What else does it mean to come to him? It means to trust him. And second, I think this is important, it's to realize then that Jesus is your representative head. Uh, He's your representative head. Let me explain what I mean by that because this is so important. How can I come to him when the whole Old Testament taught me to stay out? The whole Old Testament was structured around stay out, don't come near. You know, it just kept limiting who could come closer and closer to the high priest one time a year. It wasn't a real inviting come in, stay out. I'm holy. I do not belong in in, in that awesome presence is what I was taught. And the sacrifice is where I know that I'm a sinner. All that blood preaches to me is that the soul that sins must die. And now you're telling me, come to me? Be coming to me, the living God? How can I come into the presence and know that I am acceptable? I feel so unacceptable so much of the time. Pastor, if if you knew what I struggled with this week, you would never invite me to come. Jesus knows what you struggled with this week, believer. And he's saying, coming to him. So let me ask you this. If you knew tonight that Jesus was coming back, would you shrink back at his coming? Oh, I'm not ready. Don't, Don't come. I've got to get some things in order. Are you sure That if he came back tonight, you would be found acceptable in his sight. Are you 100% ready, know that, and are convinced? And the answer is beautiful to this. And this is what jumped out at me this week. Jesus is precious to the builder. (laughs) Jesus is precious to the builder. In verse 4, coming to him as to a living stone which was rejected by men. That word rejected, it means to to look at it with examination. And and they examined Jesus and said, we want Barabbas. We don't want this stone. We see no value in him. We're going to choose a dead stone like Barabbas. We don't want that. But, But rejected by men, but is choice chosen and is precious in the sight of God. Oh, how beautiful the cornerstone is to the builder. The the father chose the perfect, most beautiful, best cornerstone. I wish that God would give eyes to your spiritual understanding this morning. The Father and the Son and the Spirit spent all of eternity delighting in each other's presence forever, eternity. 
It's the most blessed of all relationships that have ever existed. Just forever, they were pouring out love and glory into one another. It's just, uh, it says in the Proverbs, daily you were my delight. We were delighting over each other and manifesting glory and beauty. And it was just this perfect relationship. Listen to the Puritan John Flavel. He said, God is the fountain, the ocean, the center of joy, and Jesus lay in the very bosom of the fountain of joy, day in and day out, eternally and everlastingly, the Father let out his delight into the soul of Jesus. No one has ever experienced such bliss and glorious joy than the Son. John 17, 5, Jesus said, glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was that glory and that fellowship and that beautiful relationship, glorify it. He was chosen and precious to the Father. Jesus, the Father, loved this cornerstone in a way that we can't really get our arms around. And so I just want to ask you this as we close or as we get close to closing. I've been noticing I've been saying last point like five times in my last sermons. So... Close to last point. What did it cost the Father to lay the cornerstone into the temple to build the church? Just a minute. What did it cost the Father to build this temple? And the Bible tells us that he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. He poured out his full wrath on that son that he loved so deeply. To to build this temple cost the Father his most precious son. It came at a great cost. The eternal love and delight that they had, and now the undiluted wrath of God on his own son. Wave after wave after wave on his own son. Flavel went on to say, No child was ever so one with his mother. No husband ever so one with his wife. No soul ever so one with its body as Jesus was with the Father. And the Son was ripped to shreds by the Father. The judge became the executioner. I've had all five of my kids for 17 years and one of them for 24. And I've held them and I loved them. I I don't even want to tell you this, but I used to rock them and sing like a rhinestone cowboy to them when they were little (laughs) kids. And I just, I don't know, when they're born, there's something within you that every dad and mom knows is I would die for this kid. And I fought for their souls. I prayed and shared and preached Jesus all of my days to them. I fought for their good and for their well-being. I, I have such a love for them but I just can't get over the depth of the Father's love for Christ. And he did this for you. Do you see how precious the cornerstone was? Do you see what it cost the Father to lay this stone? And now I want you to hear this. Peter says this precious value is for you who believe. This precious precious value passes on to you who will believe. In John 17, 23, Jesus said, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity, the, the church, that the world would know that thou didst send me and didst love me, even as thou didst love me. When you put your faith and trust in him, center of gravity, when you choose to build your life upon him, Because he's precious to the Father, you are now precious to the Father. (laughs) You're acceptable in his sight. You are as precious to the Father as the Son of God was because you're in Christ. The Father loves you even as he loves the Son. The Christian has to live his life off of this. It's hard to believe sometimes, but the Word of God says it, so I believe it. When Jesus was baptized, the Father said, this is my Son in who I am well pleased. He now says that of us. When he said that Jesus is the apple of my eye, now so are we. And so I want you to see this precious value 
is passed to ours. And so that now I can come to him because I am, I am wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. I'm accepted in the beloved. I, I am forgiven and I'm adopted in this family. And so I can keep coming with freedom and safety again and again and again because Jesus is my representative head. And he was so precious to the Father. And now I'm precious to the Father because I'm in Christ. That will change your life if you could get that in there. I guarantee it. And thirdly, so now he is precious to you. He's precious to the Father. He's given us salvation. He's our foundation stone. And now the gospel is he's, he's precious to you. And that's what I want to ask you this morning. Is Jesus Christ precious because Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found it and he went and sold all that he had so he could buy that field. I will give up any, everything to put it now on the cornerstone. Is he precious to where he's, he, he means more to you than anything else? You'll give up anything, your reputation, anything, because he's precious to your heart now. Spurgeon shared about this uh, man who was very ill and dying, and they found a, a prescription that could cure it. But the only problem is the prescription was, was very, very expensive. They said, you, you do realize you'll have to sell your house. And they said, you're, you're going to have to probably uh, sell all your possessions as well in order to buy this. And his answer was, is, who cares if I have a house and possessions if I die? Uh, I'll, I'll sell anything to have this that I might be healed. And so it just, this is it. It's Jesus is precious. I give up anything that I might have Christ. I count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ. Is he precious to you this morning? And if he is, coming to him is the Christian life. And I just don't ever quit coming. Again and again and again. Just make your life built on this cornerstone. Find communion and delight and joy and pleasure in the presence of this sweet stone that's choice and precious in the sight of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this temple. I thank you for the foundation stone. God, I thank you that this temple will never crumble because the foundation stone has an indestructible life. God, I thank you for Christ. I thank you for uh, what a, a beauty he is. I thank you, Father, for how precious he is to you. And I thank you for the price that you were willing to pay in order to lay this stone as the foundation of this temple. God, I thank you that you didn't spare your own son but you delivered him up for us all. God, amazing love. We thank you for it. We thank you for this pricely, infinite value. Lord, let us build our lives on it. Let everything that we're about uh, be built on Christ. Let us trust in him and his word, his promises, his work and what he's done, that he's coming again. God, let us quit being frantic and afraid because of all of our other cornerstones that we want in our life. God, help us to lean only on this one. God, let every heart be made glad this morning in their beautiful cornerstone. And God, thank you that you've opened our eyes and now Christ is precious to us. Thank you that you've led us into a little glimpse of how precious he is to you and we cry out with you, he's precious. He's beautiful, he's worth losing our life for. And I thank you for this sweet Christ. I thank you that he is our cornerstone. And I pray that he would get all the glory for all, all to Christ, we pray. Amen.